Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of the podcast called The Dictionary. The first word is bend, B-E-N-D. It is the first form. It's a verb from before the 12th century. First are the transitive definitions. One, to constrain or strain, to constrain or strain to tension by curving, as in bend a bow. Two A, to turn or force from straight or even to curved or angular. Two B, to force from a proper shape. Two C, to force back to an original straight or even condition. So an original straight or even condition. This is the weirdest podcast ever. Three, synonym is fasten, as in bend a sail to its yard. For A, to cause to turn from a straight course. Synonym is deflect. For B, to guide or turn toward, or toward, toward, man. Oh, you listen to past episodes. I have trouble with this word, toward. Synonym is direct. For C, synonym is incline or dispose. For B, to adapt to one's purpose. Synonym is distort. I think th- at least three of these synonyms have started with Ds, as in bend the rules. Five, to direct strenuously or with interest. Synonym is apply, as in bent himself to the task. Six, to make submissive. Synonym is subdue. Now we have the intransitive definitions for the first form of bend. One, to curve out of a straight line or position. Specifically, to incline the body in token of submission. Number two, To apply oneself vigorously, as in bending to their work. Number three, synonyms are incline and tend. Four, we have the number two definition for the word compromise. Bendable is an adjective. That is the thing that is able to be bent. Bend one's ear means to talk to someone at length. Ooh, you got to get those social cues. Bend over backward or bend over backwards means to make extreme efforts. Uh, Okay, next we have the second form of bend. It is a noun from the 15th century. One, to act or process, no, the act or process of bending, the state of being bent. Number two, something that is bent as to a, a curved part of a path, as of a stream or road. And then to b, the number two definition for the first form of whale, W-A-L-E, not W-H-A-L-E or W-A-I-L-E. This is W-A-L-E, and that is usually used in plural. Number three, uh, the painful manifestations, as joint pain, of decompression sickness. Ooh, oh yes. Also, the synonym decompression sickness. This is usually used with the word the, the bends. I have heard that that really sucks, and I think it could kill you. Uh, I That's part of the reason why I've never gone uh, scuba diving, but it would be fun to learn. And then around the bend is a phrase, and that means mad or crazy. Number th- uh, Now the third form of bend, it is a noun from the 15th century. One, a diagonal band that runs from the dexter chief to the sinister base on a heraldic shield. What is is a dexter chief and a sinister base. Compare to the phrase or the words bend sinister. Ah, we're coming to that shortly, actually. Interesting words or ways words are put together. Number two, uh, a knot by which one rope is fastened to another or to some object. Next is benday, B-E-N-D-A-Y, one word, Adjective from 1903, involving a process for adding shaded or tinted areas made up of dots for reproduction by line engraving. Bende is also a transitive verb. So, interesting, this is from somebody named Benjamin Day, Ben Day, who died in 1916 and he was an American printer. So it's involving a process for adding shaded or tinted areas made up of dots for reproduction by line engraving. We're going to have to see if we can find a picture or more information on this, because that sounds kind of interesting. Next, we have bender. 
we might have to show a picture in Instagram and Twitter and Facebook of Bender from Futurama. This is a noun from the 15th century. Wouldn't that be great if it just says, like, the, the robot in Futurama who says, kiss my shiny metal ass. Number one, one that bends. Number two, synonym is spree, as in hungover after a weekend bender. Now we have that word bend sinister. It is two words, noun from 1612. A diagonal band that runs from the sinister chief to the dexter base at, on a heraldic shield. So this is the thing that we read before, but over there it said dexter chief to the sinister base, and this has them backwards. Oh, the sinister, wait, oh, wait, it says dexter chief, and the second one says sinister chief, and then to the first one says to the sinister base, and then this one says to the dexter base. So they actually flip-flopped them doubly. It's a double flip-flop, people. Okay, next we have bendy, adjective from 1928. It's chiefly British. Synonyms are flexible and pliable. Next we have beneath, first form, adverb from before the 12th century. One, in or to a lower position. Synonym is below, as in the mountains and the towns beneath. S number two, directly under. Synonym is underneath. All right. Uh, let's see. This is from Middle English, beneath, from Old English, benyothan, which is from B plus neothan, which means below, akin to the Old English nithera, which means nether, N-E-T-H-E-R, and there's more at the word nether. Now we have the second form of beneath. It is a preposition from before the 12th century. 1A, in or to a lower position than. Synonym is below, as in beneath the surface. 1B, directly under, as in the ground beneath her feet. 1C, at the foot of, as in a camp beneath a hill. Number two, not suitable to the rank of, unworthy of, as in beneath his dignity. Number three, under the control, pressure, or influence of, as in the chair sagged beneath his weight. Ooh. He should maybe lose a few pounds. Number four, concealed by, under the guise of, as in a warm heart beneath a gruff manner. And now we have the last word of this episode. It is Benedict, B-E-N-E-D-I-C-T. It is a noun from 1821, a newly married man who has long been a bachelor. This is an alternative of Benedict, so B-E-N-E-D-I-C-K. No, they replaced the T with a K. Or that's what it was originally named, pay, spelled. S stop talking, just say the words. Benedict is a character in Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing, which I don't think I've ever seen. Uh, so there you have that. I'm going to pick Bender as the word of the episode because I just think Bender from Futurama is hilarious. And we are all just meatbags in his world. Uh, oh, I was going to mention, I just started watching Castle Rock. Uh, let's see, my wife watched the first season, and then she wanted to start the second season, so yesterday we watched a few episodes of the second season. They are separate stories, the first and the second season, supposedly. So, I was not lost coming into the second season, but today I started watching the first season, which is really fascinating and cool. And I actually like it better than the second season so far. But I think tonight, or the next, uh, over the next few days, I'm going to finish up both seasons. And that is a good show that you should watch. And that is it for this. Thank you very much for listening. Um, if you have some bucks to spend and you think that this is a worthy podcast to get funding, you can donate to my Patreon. Um, but Or you could find a different podcast or project or something that is more well-deserving than this. And I don't think it would be too hard for you to find something like that. Um, okay, that is it. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. This is my favorite podcast in the world. The first word is Benedictine, capital B-E-N-E-D-I-C-T-I-N-E. -E -E. Oh, it looks like today is the last day of April. Happy last day of April. It is Benedictine is a noun from the 15th century, 
a monk or a nun of one of the congregations following the rule of St. Benedict and devoted especially to scholarship and liturgical worship. Benedictine is also an adjective. Next we have benediction, noun from the 15th century. One, the invocation of a blessing, especially the short blessing with which public worship is concluded. Number two, something that promotes goodness or well-being. Number three is often capitalized, a Roman Catholic or Anglo-Catholic devotion, including the exposition of the Eucharist host in the monstrance and the blessing of the people with it. I don't know what any of that meant. Number four, an expression of good wishes. Well, I like that. Let's see, this is from Middle English, benediction, from Latin, benedictione, or benedictio, from benedicere, which means to bless, from, which is Latin, which means to speak well of, from bene, which means well, akin to the Latin bonus, which means good, uh, so bene plus dicere, which means to say, and there's more at the word bo- words, bounty or diction. That was a mouthful. Next, we have benedictory. It is an adjective from 1710, of or expressing benediction. Next is Benedict's solution. Benedict is with a capital B. This is a noun from 1921. A blue solution containing a carbonate, citrate, or citrate, and sulfate, which yields a red, yellow, or orange precipitate, Upon warning, warming, no, uh, a, precipit, a precipitate, precipitate upon warming with sugar as glucose that is a reducing agent. Well, that was complicated and it didn't help that I fumbled over the whole thing. A blue solution containing a carbonate, citrate, and sulfate which yields a red, yellow, or orange precipitates, precipitate upon warming with a sugar that is a reducing agent. This is from Stanley Rossiter Benedict who died in 1936, and Stanley was an American chemist. Next is Benedictus, with a capital B. It is a noun from 1552. One, a canticle from LK, uh, I think that's one of the books in the Bible, uh, LK 168, beginning, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, and number two, a canticle from MT 21 to 9, beginning, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. I don't know what this is. Uh, this is from Latin, which means blessed, from the verb benedicere, which is from its first word. Next, we have benefaction, noun from 1635. One, the act of benefiting. Two, a benefit conferred especially a charitable donation. Next is benefactor, noun from the 15th century, one that confers a benefit, especially one that makes a gift or bequest. Next is benefactress. It is a noun from 1711, a woman who is a benefactor. We haven't seen that that genderized version of words in a while. Um, All right. Next, we have benefic, B-E-N-E-F-I-C. It is an adjective from 1641, and we have the synonym beneficent, beneficent, which, uh, yeah, we'll be getting to shortly. And this is uh, good for that. Now we have benefice. It is a noun from the 14th century. One, an ecclesiastical office to which the revenue from an endowment is attached. Number two. A feudal estate in lands. Synonym is fief, F-I-E-F. Don't know that one. Benefice is also a transitive verb. This is from Middle Latin beneficium, from, uh, which is, means favor or promotion, from beneficus. Next we have, oh, that reminded me of a joke, which I cannot tell here, because there might be some kids listening. Okay, next is beneficence. B-E-N-E-F-I-C-E-N-C-E. It is a noun from the 15th century. One, the quality or state of being beneficent. These words are hard to say. Number two, synonym is benefaction. 
And next we have beneficent. It is an adjective from 1616. These words all blend together. I don't know about you. You don't even get to see them. You just hear them. Uh, But yeah, hopefully they're not blurring together for you. So this is beneficent with the uh, C-E-N-T is at the end of the word. Adjective from 1616. One, doing or producing good, especially performing acts of kindness and charity. Number two, synonym is beneficial. And beneficently is an adverb. Next is beneficial adjective from the 15th century. One, conferring benefits, conducive to personal or social well-being. Number two, receiving or entitling one to receive advantage, use, or benefit, as in a beneficial legacy. Beneficially is an adverb, and beneficialness is a noun. And then we have our last word, beneficials. So it's B-E-N-E-F-I-C-I-A-L-S. Noun from 1989. Organisms that feed on or parasitize pests of crops, gardens, and turf. And then there are some examples of these organisms. Ladybugs, lacewings, and bacteria. They are called beneficials. I think I am going to pick beneficent. Beneficent, I think that's how you say it, as the word of the episode because I really like that number one definition, which said, doing or producing good, especially performing acts of kindness and charity. I think we all need to do more of that because that is kind of the most important thing in the world, I think. Um, Just helping others. So that is it for today. Tomorrow we will start celebrating May, but I have a feeling that we are all or mostly all going to still be quarantined at this point. I am recording this nine days in advance. Okay, that's all. You didn't need to know all that information. Thank you very much, and this has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. I hope you are all doing well. How many times can I say that silly phrase? Uh, No, but seriously, I do hope you're doing well. Happy May. Today's May 1st. I think they call that May Day or something. Yep. Maybe eating a few pretzels before I recorded was not the best idea. The first word is beneficiary. B-E-N-E-F-I-C-I-A-R-Y. This is a noun from 1662. One. One that benefits from something. 2A. The person designated to receive the income of a trust estate. 2B. The person named as in an insurance policy, to receive proceeds or benefits. Beneficiary is also an adjective. Next, we have benefication, noun from 1871. The treatment of raw material as iron or, uh, as iron or I was going to say as iron or or, to improve physical or chemical properties, especially in preparation for smelting. Beneficiate. Beneficiate is a transitive verb. Next, we have benefit. It is the first form, noun from the 14th century. Number one is archaic, an act of kindness. Synonym is benefication. Number two, A, something that promotes well being. Synonym is advantage. To B, useful aid. Synonym is help. Help, help, I need some useful aid. 3A, financial help in time of sickness, old age, or unemployment. 3B, a payment or service provided for under... What happened to the words? A payment or service provided for under an annuity, pension plan, or insurance policy. 3C, a service as health insurance or right as to take vacation time provided by an employer in addition to wages or salary. Number four, an entertainment or social event to raise funds for a person or cause. This is, uh, we'll skip the etymology. Now we have the second form of benefit. It is a verb from the 15th century. First is transitive, to be useful or profitable to. Now we have intransitive, to receive benefit, as 
as in has benefited from his experience. Benefiter is a noun. Now we have benefit of clergy, three words. From the 15th century, one, clerical exemption from trial in a civil court. Number two, the ministration or sanction of the church. Now we have benevolence. It is a noun from the 14th century. One, disposition to do good. To A, an act of kindness. To B, a generous gift. Number three, a compulsory levy by certain English kings with no other authority than the claim of prerogative. Hmm. I like those other ones. Generous generous gift, act of kindness, good stuff. Be benevolent. Oh, that's our next word, benevolent. It is an adjective from the 15th century, 1A, marked by or disposed to doing good, as in a benevolent donor. 1B, organized for the purpose of doing good, as in a benevolent society. Number two, marked by or suggestive of goodwill, as in benevolent smiles. Benevolently is an adverb. Benevolentness is a noun. Those are hard words to say. Now we have Bengali, capital B-E-N-G-A-L-I. It is a noun from circa 1841. One, a native or resident of Bengal. Number two, the modern Indo-Aryan language of Bengal. Where's the emphasis for just Bengal? Is it Bengal or Bengal? Bengali is also an adjective, uh, and this is a Hindi word. Next, we have Bengaline, noun from 1884, a fabric with a crosswise rib made from textile fibers as rayon, nylon, cotton, or wool, often in combination. Bengaline. Next, we have Bengal light. Bengal is one word with a capital B, and then light is like the light that is shining out of my ear hole when a flashlight is shined through the other side. This is a noun from 1818, a usually blue light or flare used formerly especially for signaling and illumination. Illumination! Uh, Why is it called a Bengal light? Next we have Bengal tiger, noun from 1826, a tiger occurring especially in India. The choice of words to use occurring here seems odd to me. It occurs in India. It, but that it's, I don't know. Maybe they're just trying to keep their words short. Uh, The scientific name is Panthera tigris tigris. That's cool. Uh, And then it shows a picture of a Bengal tiger. I don't really know my tigers. I know that they what they look like, but I know there's different kinds of tigers, and this one just looks like like a tiger to me. In the second season of Westworld, which I am almost done with, uh, there is at least one Bengal tiger. Specifically a Bengal tiger, not another tiger, a Bengal tiger. All right, now we have B-E-N-G-R, capital B, capital E. It is an abbreviation for Bachelor of Engineering. Now we have B-E-N-G-S, capital B, capital E, capital S, abbreviation for Bachelor of Engineering Science. Next is benighted, B-E-N-I-G-H-T-E-D, adjective from the 15th century, one, overtaken by darkness or night. Number two, existing in a state of intellectual, moral, or social darkness. Synonym is unenlightened. Benightedly is an adverb, and benightedness is a noun. And then the last word for this episode is benign, B-E-N-I-G-N, adjective from the 14th century. One, of a gentle disposition, synonym is gracious, as in a benign teacher. To A, showing kindness or gentleness, as in benign faces. To B is next. Synonyms are favorable and wholesome, as in a benign climate. 3A, of a mild type or character that does not threaten health or life, especially not becoming cancerous, as in a benign lung tumor. 3B, having no significant effect, 
synonym is harmless, as in environmentally benign. Benignity, that's a word, benignity is a noun, and benignly is an adverb. Uh, let's see, this is from Latin benignus, from bene plus genere, or genere, which means to beget, and there's more at the word kin. Benign, to me, I always sort of think it as a middle of the road, um, more on the good side, so it's, it's, it's something that's not bad, um, but it's not great, you know, it's just, it's just good, it's fine. Um, but, you know, that's a very generalized way to describe it. Um, let's see. I think we shall pook, pook? What, what word is pook? I don't remember seeing pook in this section. Um, well, there was one um, that I wanted to say. We will pick benevolence as the word of the episode. I think that is similar to the one I picked in yesterday's episode. Um, because it's all about being generous and kind, and I am all for that at all times, especially right now. Uh, Thank you for listening to all of the yammerings that are going out of my face, and uh, I'm bringing up my list of podcasts that I have that I listen to. Um, The Three Questions with Andy Richter. This is, uh, most of my podcasts are adult. This is one of those. Um, And Andy Richter, who is Conan's sidekick, I guess you would say, he has a podcast where he interviews people um, and he is funny and entertaining and his guests are funny and entertaining and I suggest you go listen to it. That is it for today. Uh, This has been Spencer dispensing information to you, the lovely people who are listening to me. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of the most riveting podcast ever. It's the one where the dude is reading the dictionary. It is so amazingly awesome. The first word is benignancy. Benignancy. B-E-N-I-G-N-A-N-C-Y. I thought it might be benignancy because our last word was benign, and they start the same way, but it's not. It is benignancy, noun from 1876, the quality or state of being benignant or benign. You want to know what benignant means? Well, I will tell you. It is the next word. It's an adjective from circa 1782, benignant. Uh, Number one, serenely mild and kindly. Synonym is benign. Number two, synonyms are favorable and beneficial as in a benignant power. Benignantly is an adverb. This is from combining benign plus the suffix ant, A-N-T, and then in parentheses it says as in malignant, which is basically the opposite of benign or benignant. What a weird word. I would not know how to pronounce that if I hadn't been looking at this. All right, now we have benign neglect. Two words, noun from 1970, an attitude or policy of ignoring an often delicate or undesirable situation that one is held to be responsible for dealing with. Next, we have, I don't know if you can hear, but there's some rain outside. It's it's trickling down on my air conditioner. You probably can't hear it, though. Now we have benign prostatic hyperplasia. Three words, noun from 1968. Enlargement of the prostate gland caused by a benign overgrowth of chiefly granular tissue that occurs especially in some men over 50 years old and that tends to obstruct urination by constricting the urethra. Abbreviation is BPH, and it is called also benign prostatic hypertrophy or hypertrophy, something like that. Uh, Hypertrophy. See, uh, Sharon is yelling at me from the other room. I thought that the um, enunciation or the the emphasis was might be on a di- different syllable, but I couldn't figure it out in my brain. Hypertrophy. Okay, so the, uh, this is a thing that a lot of men have to deal with, dealing with their prostate in some form. Um, I have heard that you know once you hit forty or fifty years old, you should get regular checkups on that. Um, and if you have a history in your family of prostate issues or prostate cancer or something, you should probably start a bit earlier. Uh, So I hope you go get checked out 
as early as you can and catch something soon. That is my PSA for the day. Next, we have Benison or Benison, B-E-N-I-S-O-N. It is a noun from the 14th century. That's funny. So, whoop. PSA is also the, the levels that they measure to find out if you have prostate cancer or not. PSA? PSA. If your PSA level is elevated, then that means you might have prostate cancer. <laughs> See, I was saying something smart. That was like a double entendre. A double entendre. I, it was a it was a serious thing that also ended up being a joke. I am so darn smart. Um, okay, I think we almost finished Benazin. Uh, I was so rudely interrupted by some actual facts. Um, okay, the synonyms for Benazin are blessing and benediction. All right, next we have Benjamin. It is the name Benjamin with a capital B. Noun from the 14th century, a son of Jacob and the traditional eponymous ancestor of one of the tribes of Israel. This is a Hebrew name, <clears throat> Binyamin. Uh, all right, next we have Benny, uh, spelled either B-E-N-N-E. I don't even know what I just said. B-E-N-N-E or B-E-N-E. Noun from... 1769, and we have the number one definition for the word sesame. So this is of African origin, and it is akin to the Malinke word bene, B-E-N-E, with a half circle on top of the first E, and uh, with that word means sesame. I assume they mean the sesame seed. Um, all right, next we have Benny again, but it is B-E-N-N-Y. It is a noun from 1945. Number one is slang, and it is a synonym for amphetamine. Number two is also slang, a tablet of amphetamine taken as a stimulant. Well, what's the difference between one and two? I don't know. Uh, all right. Oh, and they get the name from the word benzedrine, which I assume is maybe a kind of amphetamine or something related. And then they just added IE at the end or the more likely the E sound the, uh, they took the B E N of benzedrine, Benny, but it, it says it's the suffix IE, but then in the spelling, it's just a Y. So nope, they're not consistent on this. All right. Next we have Benamil. B-E-N-O-M-Y-L. It is a noun from 1969, a derivative C14H18N4O3 of carbamate and benzimidazole, benzimidazole, used especially as a systemic agricultural fungicide. Good times. Now we have the word bent, B-E-N-T, first form noun from the 14th century. Um, I don't know if you can hear, but there are some random bang sounds every once in a while, and that is my two cats running around the living room playing. Um, just jumping off the couch and off the cat tree and onto the floor, and it probably won't stop. Okay, this is uh, number one, unenclosed grassland. 2A1, a reedy grass. 2A2, a stalk of stiff, coarse grass. And then to be, the synonym is bent grass. This is Middle English word. It means grassy place or bent grass from the Old English bionat, which looks like a, uh, a prefix. And that is akin to the Old High German binus, B-I-N-U-Z, which means rush. Now we have the second form of bent. It is an adjective from the 14th century. One, changed by bending out of an original straight or even condition, as in bent twigs. Number two, strongly inclined. Synonym is determined. That is usually used with the word on, as in was bent on going. They really, really wanted to go. Where did they want to go? You can't go anywhere right now. Number three is slang. Uh, and then we have 3A and 3B. So 3A is different from the normal or usual. And then 3B is chiefly British. Synonyms are dishonest and corrupt. And then we have a phrase, bent out of shape, extremely upset or angry. I am, I am extremely bent out of shape that, I don't know. Number three, uh, third form of bent, 
is a noun from 1586. 1A, a strong in- inclination or interest. Synonym is bias. 1B, I guess I have I have a, a strong bent towards reading the dictionary. I don't know. That's a weird example. Uh, 1B, a special inclination or capacity. Synonym is talent. Number two, capacity of endurance. Number three, a transverse framework, as in a bridge, to carry lateral as well as vertical loads. And then a synonym it says, see the word gift. Like, I have a gift for this. You could say it's bent. Okay, it, this is an irregular form of the first form of the word bend, B-E-N-D. Now we have bent grass, noun from 1677, any of a genus of grasses, including important chiefly perennial and rhizomatous or rhizomatous pasture and lawn grasses with fine velvety or wiry herbage. Ooh, that is so poetic. Fine velvety or wiry herbage? The genus name is agrostis. Next, we have the word benthamism, capital B-E-N-T-H-A-M-I-S-M, Benthamism, noun from 1829, the utilitarian philosophy of Jeremy Bentham and his followers. Benthamite is also a noun or an adjective. Uh, I don't know why Jeremy Bentham, it reminded me of Jeremy Baramy from The Good Place. If you've seen that show, then you basically know what I'm talking about. Okay, now we have the word benthic. It is an adjective from 1902. One of relating to or occurring at the bottom of a body of water. Number two, of relating to or occurring in the depths of the ocean. Now we have benthonic. It is an adjective from 1897, and the synonym is benthic, the word that we literally just read about. All right, now we are going to do one more word for this episode. It is the word benthos, B-E-N-T-H-O-S, Noun from 1891. Organisms that live on... Uh, how, what? That word did not come out of my mouth. Organisms that live on or in the bottom of a body of water. This is from Greek, or it is a Greek word, which means depth or deep sea. It is akin to the Greek word bathys. Uh, yeah, I think we read that a while ago. B-A-T-H-Y-S, um, which means deep. I remember reading all those words like bathometry or something? Is that a word? And they all have to deal with the the deep water stuff. Um, So what is the word of the episode? We are going to pick benign prostatic hyperplasia or benign prostatic hypertrophy. Hypertrophy. Uh, That is the word of the episode because, you know, you got to go get your stuff checked out. Uh, That is it for today. I appreciate you listening sharing, subscribing, rating, reviewing, comment on my Instagrams and the Twitters and the Facebooks. And that is all I got today. Until next time, this has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to this very science-related episode of The Dictionary. Thank you for joining me. Wash your hands. The first word is bentonite, B-E-N-T-O-N-I-T-E. I will, I read through the words before. I made sure that I knew how to pronounce them, but I guarantee that I'm going to screw some of them up. This word, bentonite, is a noun from 1898. An absorptive and colloidal clay used especially as a sealing agent or suspending agent, as of drugs. Bentonitic is an adjective, and this is from Fort Benton in Montana. So maybe this is where, uh, or that is where it was invented or found, maybe? No, they they probably had to make it. All right, next we have Ben Trovato. Two words. First word is Ben. Second word is T-R-O-V-A-T-O. It is an adjective from 1874. Characteristic or appropriate, even if not true. As in, the story is Ben Trovato. This is Italian, and it literally means well-found. Next, we have Bentwood. All right, this one isn't as scientific as some of the other ones, but just wait, we are going to get into them. Uh, Let's see, Bentwood is an adjective from 1862, made of wood that is bent rather than cut into shape, as in Bentwood furniture. Bentwood is also a noun. Next, we have Benum. 
It's uh, B-E-N-U-M-B, transitive verb from the 14th century. One, to make inactive. Synonym is deaden. Number two, to make numb, especially by cold. So this is from, let's see, uh, Middle English from the verb benemen, which means to deprive, from Old English beneman, which is from b plus niman, which means to take, and there's more at the word nimble. Now we have a prefix, benz, b-e-n-z, or benzo. It is related to benzene or benzoic acid, as in benzophenone, or benzophenone, also as in benzyl. All right, next we have, okay, we are going to see that prefix for the rest of the words. Uh, The first of those words is benzaldehyde. It is a noun from circa 1860, a colorless, non-toxic aromatic liquid C6H5CHO found in essential oils, as in peach kernels, and used in flavoring and perfumery, in pharmaceuticals, and in synthesis of dyes. That's D-Y-E-S. Next we have benzanthazine. Benzanthazine. No, there's an R in there. Benzanthracine. It is a noun from 1932. A crystalline carcinogenic cyclic hydrocarbon, C18H12, that is found in small amounts in coal tar. Next we have benzedrine. There is a capital B on this one, by the way. It is a noun from 1933. A preparation of the sulfate of amphetamine, C9H13N2. Oh, boy. C9H13N is in parentheses. Then there is a subscript 2. And then we have H2SO4, formerly used in medicine. So without the scientific numbers and letters, and I can't remember what that's called, um, it is a preparation of the sulfate of amphetamine, formerly used in medicine. And this is a trademark. Next, we have benzene, noun from 1835, a colorless, volatile, flammable, toxic liquid aromatic hydrocarbon, C6H6, used in organic synthesis as a solvent and as motor fuel. Benzenoid is an, also an adjective or a noun. Next, we have benzene hexachloride. Those are two separate words. This is a noun from 1884, and we have the synonym BHC. So I assume we will learn about that when we get to BHC. Next, we have benzene ring. Two words. Noun from 1877. A structural arrangement of atoms in benzene and other aromatic compounds that consists of a planar symmetrical hexagon of six carbon atoms, which derives added stability from the delocalization of certain bonding electrons over the entire ring. Compare to, okay, a few things. The 4A definition for the prefix meta, M-E-T-A, the 4B definition for the prefix orth, O-R-T-H, and the 2B definition for the prefix para, P-A-R-A. I have no idea what any of that meant. Okay, now we have benzidine. It is a noun from circa 1855. A crystalline diamine base, C12H12N2, prepared from nitrobenzene and used especially in making dyes. Next is benzimidazole, or, or benzimidazole. Benzimidazole, yep, I think that's right. Noun from 1912. A crystalline base, C7H6N2, used especially to inhibit the growth of various viruses, parasitic worms, or fungi. Also, one of its derivatives. See, I told you this was going to be a great episode. Next, we have benzene, B-E-N. Z-I-N-E. It is a noun from 1835. Any of various volatile flammable petroleum distillates used especially as solvents or as motor fuels. Next is benzoate. Benzoate. It is a noun from 1788. A salt or ester of benzoic acid. Which, oh, that'll be the last one for this episode. But we have a few more, few more to go before that. Benzocaine is next. It is a noun from 1922. A white crystalline ester, 
C9H11NO2 used as a local anesthetic, benzocaine. Next, we have a fun word to try and say, benzodiazepine. Benzodiazepine. It is a noun from 1934. Any of a group of aromatic lipophilic amines as diazepam and chlor chlordiazepoxide, something like that, used especially as tranquilizers. Did I say those words right? In the parentheses, diazepam and chlordia chlordiazepoxide. I think I did. Okay, and the last word for this episode is benzoic acid. First word, B-E-N-Z-O-I-C. Second word, acid. Noun from 1791, a white crystalline acid, C6H5COOH, found naturally, skip the parentheses, or made synthetically and used especially as a preservative of foods, in medicine, and in organic synthesis. And the part in parentheses says, as in benzoin or in cranberries, found naturally in benzoin or in cranberries. Well, this is very difficult to find the word of the episode, but I'm going to say bent wood as the word of the episode because um, many years ago, maybe 20 or so years ago, my grandpa made a canoe. And if I remember correctly, hearing this, there are no right angles in the canoe. Um, there, it's made of many, many slats of wood, and I believe he bent all the word, wood. I think he warmed it in some way and bent it, and it is a beautiful piece of art. Uh, maybe I will, I'll see if I can find a picture and post it. Um, I, there also may be no nails or anything like that. It might just be all glued together, no right angles, all glue, something like that. I'll see if I can get the details, but it's a it's beautiful, and I'm so impressed that he made this. He's also made, I think, at least one kayak and a small sailboat, and um, uh, you know, it's he can't really make things like that anymore. But uh, back in the day, he was a woodworking machine. Uh, that is it for this episode. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope you're doing well. This has been Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Today is, oh, I saw in the thing, I don't know, maybe there's no good holiday for today. We're going to skip that. So we are going to finish up those scientific words from yesterday, and then we're going to have some other normal ones. I put normal in air quotes after that. The first word for this episode is benzoin, or benzoin, or benzoin. Many ways to pronounce it. B-E-N-Z-O-I-N. It is a noun from 1562. One, a hard, fragrant, yellowish balsamic resin from trees of southeastern Asia used especially as a fixative in perfumes, as incense, and in medicine as an expectorant and skin protectant. The genus name of those trees mentioned at the beginning is Styrax. S-T-Y-R-A-X. Number two, a white crystalline hydroxy ketone, C14H12O2, made from benzaldehyde. Did we read that one in the last one? Probably. I don't remember. Um, all right. This is a modified form of Middle French benjoin from the Catalan word or Catalonian word benjoui from the Arabic word luban jawi, and it literally means frankincense of Java. That's what the Arabic one means. Now we have benzophenone. Benzophenone. It is a noun from 1877. A colorless crystalline ketone, C13H10O, used especially as a perfume fixative and in sunscreens. Also, a derivative of benzophenone. Next we have benzopyrene or benzopyrene. It is a noun from 1936. A yellow crystalline carcinogenic hydrocarbon, C20H12, found in coal tar, called also benzoapyrene. And that is good for that one. Now we have benzoquinone. Benzoquinone. A couple of ways to emphasize the syllables. This is a noun from 1903, and we just have the number one definition for the word quinone. Yes, there is an ambulance driving down the street. Next, we have benzoyl or benzoyl. 
It is a noun from circa 1855. The acyl radical of benzoic acid. Let's see. This is from the German word benzo What? Benzoischauer, which is benzoic acid plus the Greek heil, which means matter, and it or literally means wood. H y l e. That's the Greek word. Next we have benzoyl peroxide. Two words. Noun from 1924. A white crystalline compound, C14H10O4, used in bleaching and in medicine, especially in the treatment of acne. Next, we have benzyl or benzyl. Benzyl, noun from 19, no, 1868. A monovalent radical, C6H5CH2, derived from toluene. Benzylic is an adjective. Next is a non-scientific word, unless you are a scientist of literature. It is Beowulf, capital B-E-O-W-U-L-F, noun from before the 12th century, a legendary Geatish warrior and hero of the old English poem Beowulf. Beowulfian is an adjective. Next we have bepaint, the word paint with B-E at the front. It is a transitive verb from circa 1555. It is archaic, and the synonym is tinge, T-I-N-G-E. Next is bequeath. Verb, uh, looks like just transitive verb from before the 12th century. One, to give or leave by will. Used especially of personal property, like, when I am done with this project, I will bequeath this book to somebody else, in which, and then they can... Sell it off to the highest bidder. Number two, to hand down. Synonym is transmit. Bequeathal is a noun. It is from Middle English bequeathen, from Old English bequethen, which is b plus quethon, which means to say. And there's more at the word quoth, not quote. Quoth, q-u-o-t-h. Next is bequest. Noun from the 14th century, one the act of bequeathing. Number two, something bequeathed. I feel like I have a lisp. Synonym for number two is legacy. Now we have berate. It is a transitive verb from 1548, to scold or condemn vehemently and at length. And a synonym is the word scold. Next we have berber, capital B-E-R-B-E-R. It is a noun from 1732, one, a member of any of various peoples living in northern Africa west of Tripoli, to a, a branch of the Afro-Asiatic language family comprising languages spoken by various peoples of northern Africa and the Sahara, as the Tuaregs and the Kabyles, not sure how to pronounce those, T-U-A-R-E-G-S, Tuaregs, and K-A-B-Y-L-E-S, Kabyles. And then we have 2B, any one of the Berber languages. Now we have Berberine, noun from circa 1847, a bitter crystalline yellow alkaloid. Oh, we got the scientific words back. C20H19NO5, obtained from the roots of various plants as barberry, and used in medicine especially for its anti- antimicrobial properties. We could use some more of that right now. Next, we have berberis. It is a noun from circa 1868, and we have the synonym barberry, which we read before. Uh, let's see, this is from New Latin. It is the genus including the barberry, an alternative of the Middle Latin barbaris, which means barberry, from the Arabic barbaris. Next we have, now this is a weird word, it looks French, a uh, weird word for me to say, berceuse, I think it's berceuse, B-E-R-C-E-U-S-E. It is a noun from 1858. One, a musical composition usually in 6-8 time that resembles a lullaby. For those who don't know, 6-8 time goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, um... That is that. And then number two is a synonym, lullaby, bersuze. Maybe I'll see if I can find an example of this. Um, 
so this is French from the French word bercer, which means to rock. Now, I think that means like to rock back and forth, like a rocking chair. But in my mind, my first thought was to rock like rock and roll, which does not make any sense for a lullaby. Uh, then is from Old French bercier, which is from bears, which means cradle. And I think we're going to do one more for this episode. It is berdash, B-E-R-D-A-C-H-E. It is a noun from 1806. Uh, ooh, this is, it tells me in italics, it is sometimes offensive. So apologies if I offend anybody. An American Indian who assumes the dress, social status, and role of the opposite sex. Um, uh, yes, well, I have heard of this. I've not heard of the, the word berdash. Uh, this is American French, alternative of the French berdash, which means catamite which is from the Italian dialect in southern Italy, bardaccio, which is from the Arabic bardage, which means, which means slave, from the Persian bardag, which means prisoner, and then from the Middle Persian vartak. Wow, that word has some crazy uh, evolutions through the ages and through the parts of the world. Um, that's crazy. Um, well... I, I, I hope that, you know, by saying that word at all, it was not offensive to anybody. Um, but I, I think that, you know, if there is somebody who, especially in this day and age, who assumes the dress, social status, and role of the opposite sex, uh, you know, that should be respected in all walks of life. And uh, that sucks that that's not always been the case. Um, so I think we will go ahead and pick that one, bear dash, as the word of the episode, because there wasn't anything else That really jumped out at me, and I think that one needs the most attention right now. So that is it for this episode. Thank you very much. And that is it. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to this uh, Cinco de Mayo episode of the podcast called The Dictionary. Um, Americans like to celebrate Cinco de Mayo in very uh, non-respectable ways. So we are going to do this the respectable way by reading some English American words. Uh, The first word is bereave, B-E-R-E-A-V-E. It is a transitive verb from before the 12th century. One, to deprive of something, usually used with the word of, as in madame, You have bereft me of all words. That is from Shakespeare. Uh, You will notice that bereft is not bereave, but we will be getting to bereft soon. So you will learn what that means. Number two, to take away a valued or necessary possession, especially by force. And we are going to move on to bereaved. It is the first form. It is an adjective from 1799, suffering the death of a loved one. Now we have the second form of bereaved. It is a noun from 1815, one who is bereaved. So it is the person who is doing the bereaving. Um, Now we have bereavement. This is a very uplifting episode, isn't it? Uh, Bereavement is a noun from circa 1731, the state or fact of being bereaved, especially the loss of a loved one by death. You know, death is something that we don't talk about enough, and I think we should. So... And on that note, let's say bereft, B-E-R-E-F-T. It is an adjective from 1565, 1A, deprived or robbed of the possession or use of something, usually used with the word of, as in both players are instantly bereft of their poise, and that is from A-E, weir, W-I-E-R. Next is 1B, lacking something needed, wanted, or expected, used with the word of, again, As in, the book is completely bereft of an index. And that was the end of the sentence. And that is from the Times Lit Sup. Number two synonym is bereaved, as in a bereft mother. So that was the crossover. Bereaved and bereft. Now we have beret, B-E-R-E-T, something that I don't think I probably look very good in. This is a noun from 1827. A visorless, usually woolen cap with a tight headband and a soft, full, flat top. Oh, look at that wonderful thing you're wearing with a tight headband and a soft, full, flat top. I shall call it a beret. 
This is a French word from Gascon. What's Gascon? Is that like a language? G-A-S-C-O-N. Uh, that word, beret, with two R's from the old Occitan, uh, which means cap. Maybe it, they have the same word. And there is more at the word beretta, B-I-R-E-T-T-A. And now we have berg, B-E-R-G, noun from 1818. We have the synonym iceberg. Next is bergamot. Ber- bergamot, I think that's how it's pronounced. B-E-R-G-A-M-O-T, noun from 1650. One, a pear-shaped orange of a Mediterranean tree having a rind that yields an essential oil used especially in perfumery. Also, this oil. I enjoy doing this podcast because other than reading through the words once, I don't read the definitions. Before I hit record, I read through the words now to make sure that I generally have an idea of how to pronounce them. But I am basically blind as to what's coming, um, especially when it comes to words that I'm not familiar with, like bergamot. Um, I, I enjoy just getting to it and then reading what it is and being basically completely shocked as if it's a word I don't know. I mean, it could be anything. It literally could be anything in the world. Um, and you know, sometimes it's weird, uh, scientific concepts or something that I can't wrap my brain around. And sometimes it's religious things. Cause this book has a lot of Catholic stuff in there. And sometimes it's fruit and plants and it's just been very interesting. Sorry, I had to say that. Okay, number two for bergamot, any of several mints and compare to the uh, synonym wild bergamot. The genus name for the mints is monarda, and I forgot to say that the scientific name for this Mediterranean tree from number one is Citrus arantium bergamia. Next is berger, B-E-R-G-E-R-E. It is a noun from 1762, an upholstered armchair of an 18th century style having an exposed wood frame. This is French, literally means shepherdess, which is the feminine of berger, which it means shepherd, so that's the male version, berger means shepherd, uh, from old French berger, from new Latin berbicarius, from Latin vervec or vervex, Ver, verbex, burbex, wow, so many ways to say that word. Uh, that means weather, W E T H E R. <clears throat> Moving on to be ribboned. It is an adjective from 1853, adorned with ribbons. Next is berry berry, B E R I, twice. It is a noun from 1703, a deficiency disease marked by inflammatory or degenerative changes of the nerves digestive system and heart and caused by a lack of a lack of or inability to assimilate thiamine S- does not sound fun this is from a sinhalese word berry berry um now we have berk b e r k noun from uh, 1836. It is British and it means fool. And there is a, there's a naughty word coming up because this is, looks like it's related to British, uh, that sort of rhyming dialect that they have. It says it's probably short for Berkeley or Berkshire, which means hunt. And that is rhyming slang. That's what they call it. Rhyming slang. Uh, that is rhyming slang for cunt. So if you, you can make the connection if you want. Moving on to Berkeleyan, capital B-E-R-K-E-L-E-I-A-N, or you could spell it with a Y instead of an I. This is an adjective from 1813 of relating to or suggestive of Bishop Berkeley or his system of philosophical idealism. Berkeleyan is a noun and Berkeleyanism is a noun. Next, we have, uh, so the last one was Barclian. This is Berkelium. Uh, there's an M. Noun from 1950, a radioactive metallic element produced artificially as by bombarding, amic- uh, oh, this word, Amers- Amer- americium. Uh, it's the element that sort of looks like the word America, americium. All right, let's start the parentheses over again. As by bombarding americium 241 with alpha particles. And then it says to see the element table. Okay, 
Moving on to Berkshire, capital B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E, noun from 1831, any of a breed of medium-sized black swine with white markings. And they are from Berkshire, England. Next, we have Berm, B-E-R-M, noun from 1704. One, a narrow shelf, path, or ledge, typically at the top or bottom of a slope. Also, a mound or wall of earth or sand. And that is the end of that sentence, as in a landscaped berm. Number two, the shoulder of a road. This is from French, berm, from D, which I think might be Dutch, berm, which means strip of ground along a dike, akin to the Middle English brim, B-R-I-M-M-E, which means brim. Next is Bermuda bag. Two words. The first B is capitalized. It is... It's a noun. I knew it was a noun, but I couldn't see the N. A noun from 1979. A round or oval-shaped handbag with a wooden handle and removable cloth covers. This is from Bermuda Islands, the Bermuda Islands in the North Atlantic. And then finally, in this episode, we have Bermuda Grass, capital B-E-R-M-U-D-A, and then the word grass. It is a noun from 1808, a creeping, creeping, stoloniferous, stoloniferous southern European grass, often used as a lawn and pasture grass. And the scientific name is Cynodon dactylon. Ooh, that sounds like a robot robot's name or alien's name in a sci-fi movie or TV show. Cynodon Dactylon. Um, Okay, we are going to pick... I had one in my mind, and now I don't know where it went. Um, I'm going to pick bergamot as the word of the episode because that was the one where I uh, uh, had this thought of how, why I... One of the reasons why I like doing this. That is going to be it for this episode. Thank you very much. Celebrate Cinco de Mayo in a healthy way. Maybe by yourself. Maybe make a margarita or something at home. Make some tacos. Um, Again, I hope this is not offensive in any way. But, you know, I love that food. So I'll eat it whenever I want. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of the Dictionary Podcast. It's still going strong. I try to record um, about two episodes a day. I don't always get to do it, but sometimes I do. The first word for this episode is Bermuda Onion, capital B-E-R-M-U-D-A. Second word, onion, noun from 1876, a large flattened onion that has a mild flavor and yellow, white, or red skin. Well, how or why is it flattened? Is it like a pancake? Has it been flattened in some way uh did somebody sit on it or is it does it just grow non-spherical what there's a word for that i don't know okay the next word is bermuda rig uh bermuda and then the word rig noun from 1853 and we have the synonym oh it's a good one marconi rig actually i first read that as macaroni rig which would have been much better but marconi rig is good too Next, we have Bermudas. It is a noun from 1961, and we have the synonym Bermuda shorts, and this is especially southern. Uh, so they just decided not to say the word shorts in the southern southern area. The next is Bermuda shorts, noun from 1951, knee-length walking shorts. Next, we have Bernese Mountain Dog. Three separate words. Noun from 1935. Any of a breed of large, powerful, long-coated black dogs of Swiss origin that have had that have tan and white markings and were developed as draft animals. And this is from Bern, which is in Switzerland. Next we have Bernoulli's Principal. Two words. First word is capital B-E-R-N-O-U-L-L-I apostrophe S. This is a noun from 1940, a principle in hydrodynamics. And then it has a colon. The pressure in a stream of fluid is reduced as the speed of the flow is increased. The pressure in a stream of fluid is reduced 
as the speed of the flow is increased. So that is Bernoulli's principle. This is from Daniel Bernoulli, who died in 1782 and was a Swiss physicist. Swiss physicist. Say that a lot of times fast. Uh, Maybe he had a Bernese mountain dog because they were both Swiss. Next we have Bernoulli trial. Uh, It's the same Bernoulli, um, well, it's spelled the same as the previous one, but it is not the same Bernoulli. This is a noun from 1951, one of the repetitions of a statistical experiment having exactly two mutually exclusive outcomes each with a constant probability of occurrence. This is from Jacques Bernoulli, who died in 1705 and was a Swiss mathematician. Um, so one died in 1705, one died in 1782. I wonder if they were related. It's possible. Next we have buried. It's not like you, you bury something in the ground. This is B-E-R-R-I-E-D. It is an adjective from 1785. One, having or covered with berries, as in a buried shrub, or buried shrubs, not a buried shrubs. Number two. Bearing eggs, and bearing in this context is B-E-A-R-I-N-G, bearing eggs, as in a buried lobster. English is hard. There are words that sound the same that are spelled differently that mean very different things. Now we have the word bury. It is the first form. Um, It is a noun from before the 12th century. 1A, a pulpy and usually edible fruit as a strawberry, raspberry, or checkerberry, what's a checkerberry, of small size, irrespective of its structure. 1b, a simple fruit, as a grape, blueberry, tomato, or cucumber, with a pulpy or fleshy pericarp. I knew that tomatoes and cucumbers were fruits because they've got seeds, but they're considered berries too? I don't know, I gotta look more into this. Now we have 1C, the dry seed of some plants, as wheat. Mm. So they call the dry seeds of wheat berries. And number two, an egg or a, no, an egg of a fish or lobster. And that is connected to the number two definition for the last word we read, which was buried. Um, Let's see, we don't need to read the etymology. I just had some berries in my smoothie this morning. Some frozen berries, also some other frozen fruits. Next, we have the second form of berry. It is a verb. Looks like it's just intransitive. From circa 1780. One, to bear or produce berries, as in a burying shrub. Number two, to gather or seek berries. Let's go berry. Now we have berry-like. It is one word, adjective, from 1847. One, resembling a berry, especially in size or structure. Number two, a uh, being small and rounded. Synonym is, I think it is pronounced coccoid or coxoid or something like that. C-O-C-C-O-I-D. I guess that also means being small and rounded. Now we have bersim, B-E-R-S-E-E-M. It is a noun from circa 1902. A succulent annual clover, cultivated as a forage plant and green manure crop, especially in the alkaline soils of the Nile Valley and in the southwestern U.S., called also Egyptian clover. And the scientific name is Trifolium alexandrinum. And this is from the Arabic barsim, which is from the copt c-o-p-t word bersim well is copt a language or is it a an abbreviation for a language one of these days i will have a marker in this spot you'd think that i would be smart enough to do that copt is coptic the language is coptic didn't know what that was now we have berserk B-E-R-S-E-R-K. It is the first form. It is a noun from 1818. One, an ancient Scandinavian warrior frenzied in battle and held to be invulnerable. Mm, gotta, gotta look up this berserk guy. Number two, one whose actions are relentlessly defiant. And let's see, this is from Old Norse berserker. 
probably from the prefix ber, which means bear, B-E-A-R, plus the end part circer, which means shirt. So bear shirt? I don't know. That's weird. Um, I believe, I mean, I know in mall rats, um, Jay talks about who some comic book character who has a berserker move. Was it Wolverine or somebody else? I don't know. I don't really read comics, honestly. Some comic book character has this berserker move, so this is where they got that name from. Uh, now we have the second form of berserk. It is an adjective from 1851. Synonyms are frenzied and crazed, usually used in the phrase go berserk, as in sinister ravings of an imagination gone berserk. That is a quote from John Gruen. Berserk is also an adverb, and berserkly can also be an adverb. Now we have the last word of this episode. It is birth, B-E-R-T-H. We've got two forms. First form, noun, from the 15th century. 1A, sufficient distance for maneuvering a ship. 1B, an amount of distance maintained for safety. As in, give the fire a wide berth. 2A, the place where a ship lies when at anchor or at a wharf. 2B, a space for an automotive vehicle at rest. As in, a truck loading berth. Number three, a place to sit or sleep, especially on a ship or vehicle. Synonym is accommodation. 4A, a billet on a ship. Is it belay? I think it's billet. A billet on a ship. For B, synonyms are job and position and place, as in a starting birth on the team. Now we have the second form of birth. It is a transitive. Oh, it's C book. You did it to me again. It's just a verb from 1667, and we are going to start with the transitive definitions. One, to bring into a birth. Number two, to allot a birth to. And then the intransitive definition says to come into a birth. So those were all the words. Um, Let's see. Let us pick Bernoulli's principle as uh, the word of the episode because that sounds like an interesting concept. And I I know I've heard of it before. Um, I would need to probably learn, uh, uh, find some more specific examples to really understood what that description said. Um, should I tell you about another podcast I'm listening to? Uh, let's see. I don't remember where we left off. Uh, I finished Castle Rock. Um, I finished the second season of Westworld. I'm now a few episodes into the third season of Westworld. Um, yeah, that's that. Uh, let's see. Uh, the Weird Alphabet. The Weird Alphabet. It is four guys who are going through Weird Al songs in alphabetical order. Uh, They've been doing it for a few years. They're getting close to the end, uh, so hopefully he releases a new album soonish so they have more content. Um, I've actually been a guest on three of their episodes, and one of them has been a guest on, I think, two of my episodes, Uh, so I'm sure you've heard me mention it before. Um, So if you like Weird Al, go check those guys out. That is going to be it for this um, episode. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary Podcast, the one where the guy is saying the stuff with the, all the words and the definitions. This first word is Bertha, B-E-R-T-H-A. It is a noun from uh, 1842, a wide round collar covering the shoulders. This is French, uh, Berth, from Berth with a capital B, which means Bertha with a capital B, so it's probably the name. Um, Oh, that was a specific person, Bertha, who died in 783. No no one at the beginning of that, not 1783, just 783. Um, That was a long time ago. Uh, And she was the queen of the Franks. So she probably wore this thing, uh, which there is a picture of, this uh, wide round collar covering the shoulders. Uh, Looks kind of fancy. So she probably wore one, and they said, hey, we're going to call that a Bertha. All right, now we have Bertillon System, capital B-E-R-T-I-L-L-O-N. Second word, system. Noun from 1893, a system for identifying persons based on bodily measurements, photographs, and notation of data as markings, color, and thumb line impressions. Hmm. Big data. 
This is from Alphonse Bertillon, who died in 1914 and was a French criminologist. Well, sure, of course, then. The definition makes a lot more sense now. Now we have Beryl, B-E-R-Y-L. It is a noun from the 13th century. A mineral consisting of a silicate of beryllium and aluminum of great hardness that occurs in colorless hexagonal prisms when pure and in various colors as green, blue, yellow, or pink, or pink when not pure, that is valued as a source of gems and that is the principal source of beryllium. Long definition. You know what I realized recently is that um, I don't, th- or I think that every single definition um, in this book is one sentence. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that they've written it in such a way that it can just be one sentence. That's kind of interesting. Okay, this is uh, from Middle French beryl, from Latin berylis, from Greek berylos, which mean, uh, or which is a back formation from berylion, which means beryl, and that is of Indo-Aryan origin, and is akin to the Prakrite word verulia, or veluria, couple ways to write that word, and that means beryl. Now we have beryllium. It is a noun from circa 1847. A steel gray, light, strong, brittle, toxic, divalent, metallic element used chiefly as a hardening agent in alloys. And then it says to see the element table. Well, there were a whole lot of adjectives that describe that. Steel gray, light, strong, brittle, toxic, divalent, and metallic. That was seven Seven adjectives, but a couple of them seem to uh, conflict. Strong and brittle? Interesting. Okay, next we have beseech. This is a verb from the uh, 12th century. Transitive is first. One, to beg for urgently or anxiously. Number two, to request earnestly. Synonym is implore. Now we have intransitive. To make supplication. And then we have a synonym. It is the word beg, B-E-G. Beseechingly is an adverb. Now we have beseem, B-E-S-E-E-M. This is an intransitive, it's a verb from the 13th century, starting with intransitive. It is archaic, to be fitting or becoming. And now the transitive is also archaic, to be suitable to. Synonym is befit. Next, we have beset. It is a verb from before the 12th century, and I think we just have transitive. One, to set or stud with or as if with ornaments. Number two, synonyms are trouble and harass, as in inflation besets the economy. 3a, to set upon, synonym is assail, as in the settlers were beset by savages. Uh, 3b, to hem in, Synonym is surround. Besetment is a noun, and that is good for that. Next is besetting, adjective from 1634. Constantly present or attacking. Synonym is obsessive. Now we have beshrewed. It is a verb, transitive verb from the 14th century. It is especially southern, also archaic, and we have the synonym curse. I am going to put a curse on you. I am going to beshrew you. Yeah, that's a weird word. Next, we have beside. It is a preposition from the 13th century. It is the first form. 1A, by the side of. Synonym, uh, no, no, not synonym, as in walk beside me. 1B, in comparison with. 1C, on a par with. Number two, synonym is besides. Number three, not relevant to, as in, beside the point. Well, I usually put an S at the end. I would say besides the point. I guess it depends on the context. Beside oneself means in a state of extreme excitement. Ooh, I'm so excited. I'm beside myself with excitement that I get to read this book to you. Um, All right, now we have the second form of beside. It is an adverb from the 14th century. One is archaic. Synonym is nearby. Number two is also archaic. Synonym is besides with an S. That is our next word, besides. First form, preposition from the 14th century. One, 
Synonyms are other than and except, as in no one besides us. Number two, together with, as in a decision that, besides being practical, is morally right. What an interesting example. Now we have the second form of besides adverb from uh, 1564. One, as well. Synonym is also. Number two, synonyms are moreover and furthermore. Now we have the third form of besides. It is an adjective from 1594. Synonym is else. Now we have the last word for this episode. It is besiege. B-E-S-I-E-G-E. It is a verb from the 14th century, and this one goes over to the next page. I think it is just transitive. Uh, Number one, to surround with armed forces. 2A, to press with requests. Synonym is importune. 2B, to cause worry or distress to. Synonym is beset, as in doubts besieged him. And then besieger is a noun. So, what is going to be the word of the episode? Um, Let's pick Bertha as the word of the episode, because I learned something new, as I always do when I do this. Uh, All right, that is going to be it for this episode. Thank you for listening. Uh, Rate and review. Uh, The five star really helps a lot. Um, Even if you don't think it's five stars, I would love for you to give me a five-star review, and then give me some constructive criticism. Um, but writing a an actual review, writing something, it could be two words, super short, that also really helps me uh, get more exposure on this thing. Um, and then if you want to talk to me, send me a message on the various things, the Twitter, Instagram, email, voicemail, um, Facebook, and that's it. I'm going to go blow my nose because it's running. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of the podcast called The Dictionary, yet another episode. It never ends. Okay, the first word for this episode is besmear, B-E-S-M-E-A-R. It is a transitive verb from before the 12th century. Synonym is smear. Now we have besmirch. It is a transitive verb from 1599. Synonyms are sully and soil. Now we have besom. That is not how it looks. It looks like it's besom, but it is besom, B-E-S-O-M. It is a noun from before the 12th century. We have the number two definition for the word broom, especially one made of twigs, a broom made of twigs, a besom. Um, that is good for that. Now we have besom pocket, two words, noun from 1966, a pocket with a welted slit opening. I do not know what a welted slit opening is. And is it related to a broom made of twigs in any way? I don't know. Now we have besat. It is a transitive verb from... 1567. One, we have the number two definition for the word infatuate. Number two, to make dull or stupid, especially to muddle with drunkenness. Besottedly is an adverb. Uh, Let's see, the etymology says this is from B plus sot, and sot, I guess, means to stultify. Stultify, that's an interesting word. Now we have bespatter. It is a transitive verb from 1600, and we have the synonym spatter. Next is bespeak. It is another transitive verb, and I think it's just transitive, um, and it is from the year 1533. Number one, to hire, engage, or claim beforehand. Number two, to speak to, especially with formality. Synonym is address. Number three, synonym is request, as in bespeak a favor. Number four, A, synonyms are indicate and signify, as in her performance bespeaks considerable practice. It shows that she practiced a lot. Practice is very helpful. Now we have 4B, to show beforehand, synonym is foretell. Now we have the word bespectacled. It is an adjective from 1742. Wearing spectacles. 
I currently am bespectacled. I don't know if I could ever go to contacts. I think the idea of sticking my finger in my eye uh, does not sound appealing. I am actually very bad with drops. Uh, I don't know why, but I have a very hard time taking drops. Uh, so I think putting my finger in my eye would be a whole lot worse. They say that you get used to it, but I don't know. I think I'm fine with spectacles. My eyes aren't all that bad though. That's the thing. I can see pretty well without them. Um, all right, now we have bespoke or also bespoken. It is a an adjective from 1607. 1A synonym is custom made with a hyphen as in a bespoke suit. 1B dealing in or producing custom made articles. Number two is a dialect the dialectic version, I, I don't know where the dialect is. Uh, the synonym is engaged. Um, now we have besprent. Yeah, that's a funky word, besprent. It is an adjective from the 14th century. It is archaic. Well, no surprise there. And it means sprinkled over. Interesting. All right, let's read some etymology for this one. It is from Middle English, besprent, from the verb besprengen. Uh, which means to be, uh, to besprinkle, which is from Old English besprengon, which is from be plus sprengon, which means to scatter. It is akin to the Old English springon, which means to spring. Um, and so if you go get a donut or a cupcake and you want sprinkles on it, you should say that you want it bes- besprent, besprent. And then they'll say, what is this word besprent? And you can say it means sprinkled over, but it is archaic. Nobody uses it anymore. I learned it on the podcast called The Dictionary. You should go listen to it. Okay, next we have similar, besprinkle. It is a transitive verb from the 15th century. The synonym is just sprinkle. Uh, Now we have, all right, so this one should be interesting. We have Bessel function, capital B-E-S-S-E-L, second word, function, noun from 1872, one of a class of transcendental functions expressible as infinite series and occurring in the solution of the differential equation. If you understood what that meant, I would like you to please send me a message and explain it to me with some uh, concrete examples. That would be great. So this is from Friedrich W. Bessel, who died in 1846, and he was a Prussian astronomer. So I think this concept sounds fascinating. I just don't understand what it is. Lucky for you, and maybe me, there is a formula using letters. Um, So I will describe it to you, although I think a lot of us are not going to understand what it is. Uh, It's Maybe it's an equation, a formula, because there's an equal sign in it. All right, so on the left side of the equal sign... We have x squared, and then next to the x squared, we are multiplying that by uh, a fraction. On the top of the fraction, the numerator is d squared times y, and then in the denominator, it is d times x squared. So all of that is multiplied by the x squared that we mentioned before. Now, we are going to add that to something similar. Instead of x squared, it is x, and then in the numerator, we have just dy, no squared, and then in the denominator, we have dx. So it, so the whole thing on the left side of the equals is x squared times d squared times y divided by dx squared plus x times d times y divided by d times x. Then on the right side of the equal sign, that all equals, in parentheses, we have a section. It is n squared minus x squared. And then that whole section, in parentheses, is multiplied by y. So if I felt so uh, inclined uh, in my episode description, you will probably already know the answer to whether I did this or not. Maybe I'll write this out and maybe I'll put in some example numbers and to show how it is equal to itself. Anyway, we're going to move on to Bessemer process. It is a noun from 1856, a process of making steel from pig iron by burning out carbon and other impurities by means of a blast of air forced through the molten metal. And this is from Sir Henry Bessemer. Uh, I don't remember how many episodes ago it was, but I mentioned my cats running around. They are currently doing it again because they just had some food and now they have energy. All right. Now we are going to read the last word of this episode. It is the word best, B-E-S-T. 
There are five forms. I'm not sure if I'm going to read them all in this episode. I might uh, push a couple to the next episode. All right. The first form of best is an adjective. It is a superlative of the word good. It is from before the 12th century. Number one, excelling all others, as in the best student. Number two, most productive of good, colon, offering or producing the greatest advantage, utility, or satisfaction, as in, what is the best thing to do? Well, that should have a question mark at the end of it, but it doesn't. And number three, the synonyms are most and largest, as in, it rained for the, well, you're supposed to say the best part of the day, but I think in this case, you're going to say the better part of their vacation. I don't know why I said day. I didn't, I just assumed I knew the rest of the example. Uh, let's see. So this is from Middle English, from Old English, best, B-E-T-S-T, akin to the Old English bot, which means remedy, and there's more at the word better. And I think um, we'll do one more of the bests. This is an adverb, super, superlative of the word well, from before the 12th century. One, in the best way. Two, greatest advantage, as in, some things are best left unsaid. Number two, synonym is most, as in, those best able will provide needed support. We have a phrase, as best, and it means as well, skillfully, or accurately as, as in, try to do it as best you can. Uh, when I was in first or second grade, I think, the, the teacher divided uh, our class into groups of four and for some project. I don't know what it was. And we were supposed to come up with a name of our group. And my thought, which did not, did not get voted on, was to take the first letter of our names, which ended up spelling out best. And I was like, this is perfect. B-E-S-T. We're the best. But they didn't like that idea. I th still think it was a good idea for, you know six or seven year olds all right that is going to be it for this episode thank you very much for listening go do the rate and review subscribe share 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 uh if you want to give me some bucks i got patreon there's a couple exclusive episodes and um you know if people start to join uh maybe uh i will add more because that's what you are there for um i've got one thank you very much so this has been spencer dispensing information goodbye <laughs>